Okay, we will continue our sermon sessions in the Gospel of Luke, and we find ourselves in chapter 4. And chapter 4 in the portion of Scripture will be verses 1 through 13. Verse 1 says, and I quote, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. So Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led around by the Holy, uh, by the Spirit in the wilderness. And this, of course, for 40 days, verse 2, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. Now we take a pause and understand the message and seek practical application. So here is Jesus. He is man. He is in flesh. God on earth. The Messiah, the anointed one. And he has to go through this temptation, this trial, this challenge in his life while experiencing humanity. God lowered himself into the form of man with flesh, and with flesh comes temptation. And he would be made aware of the human condition, which would find temptation in the things the flesh sought to indulge, you see. For again, how could we communicate, or be in fellowship to that measurement with God if God would not understand the temptation you and I face daily living in these fleshly containers, these physical vessels. And Jesus had to, in his will, remain faithful to the Father on high and not deviate, compromise, or contaminate himself with the desires of the flesh. Therein, of course, revealing his mind, his heart, his purpose, his ministry, and therein an example to you and I in whom we should follow. And what is interesting, my dear friends, in practical application moving forward, we see here in the text that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Word of God. For the penmanship of the Holy Spirit wrote the Word. And we know that the Holy Spirit is God. From the Father and the Son to the Spirit, God, one God, Three persons. So he is filled with the word and he returns to the Jordan, uh, returns from the Jordan, sorry, and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Here's how we read that and here's how this involves our participation in life. Friends, we as Christians, reading the words of the Holy Spirit, studying the words of the Holy Spirit, believing the words of the Holy Spirit, practicing, obeying the words of the Holy Spirit, we are led by the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are led by the Holy Spirit. Where? Well, in the wilderness. This world is a wilderness, and it's filled with temptation. And if we look towards Christ as the sole source example 
of our instruction and guidance, then we will recognize that we too can persevere through the temptations of the devil, the desires of the flesh and selfish ambition, pride, and other corrupt behaviors and practices or actions of the world. So here is the Christ. He is filled with the Word. He is led by the Word to fulfill the Word. He is the Word. And he finds himself in the wilderness, which is the world. And in this state for 40 days, he's being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, so he understands what being hungry is all about. An interesting and perhaps a bit of a humorous perspective, but God on earth, for the first time, hearing his stomach growl. Like, whoa, I'm hungry. Now I can see why my fellow human beings get hungry. These bodies, of course, he understands the mechanics and the biology. I'm simply bringing forth a perspective to his experience on earth. Remember, he lowered himself and it was not simply to, hey, I'm going to go down. Hey, dad, I'm going down to earth there. I'm going to go see what they are all about down there, you know. No, it was not merely for human experience, though it was indeed a part of his experience. So for 40 days being tempted by the devil and he ate nothing during those days and when they had ended, he became hungry. Well, uh, he was hungry. His body is hungry. But yet he remains focused is the idea. Focused in his uh, uh, fast. In his fast, he is focused. Once you can set aside the desires of the flesh or the necessities of the, the human condition, to solely focus on the priority, you become meditative and passionate, driven by the word to be faithful and upright, holding the integrity of our faith in Christ. Christ knows the faith. He is the faith. And he certainly was focused on the task and achieving completing, fulfilling the task. And so the devil says to Jesus, and this, of course, friends, we should, we should not take for granted if you truly allow your thoughts to open and receive this recorded account of God on earth. Within the interaction that took place with the devil. We walk on the same earth that Jesus walked on. You and I walk on the same earth that Moses and Noah walked on. That Adam and Eve walked on. So the devil has something to say to Jesus. In verse 3, he says, If, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. We remember, of course, in the direct context of the portion of Scripture that Jesus became hungry, and he must have indeed been very hungry. Not the Westerns, Westerners' culture of being hungry. I haven't eaten for an hour. I'm starving. You know how we do that. We're spoiled, aren't we? I haven't eaten for a, a good hour. Oh man, I could, I could eat a cow. You just ate a cow an hour ago. Yeah, but I'm hungry again. No, we're we're speaking of, of course, true, deep hunger. Some of us have experienced not eating for 24 hours, and that seems, whoo, 48 hours. Oh man. So Jesus would be found in the most desperate hunger, if you will. Hence, of course, the devil, who knows what you struggle with, who can see perhaps a location that he could utilize to his advantage. Oh, he must be hungry. 
He hasn't eaten in a long time. I'll get him through food. If. See, the devil is conditional as well, isn't he? He has conditions to set forth before us. Well, if you want to have everything, you'll have to serve me. You'll have to do something that is corrupt. You'll have to govern your thoughts with behavior that is not upright and God-fearing. If you are the Son of God, if you really are who you claim to be, you know that's a temptation for us. Well, I can. I don't know if you can. I doubt you can. Oh yeah, I'll prove you wrong. That's how easily we can become manipulated. Pride. I have to prove myself right to this person who's challenging me. No, you don't. No, you really don't. If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Is it a sin to eat bread if you're hungry? No. So what's the problem here? God, Jesus should have just been like, oh yeah, I'm starving. You're right. That's a good suggestion. Thanks, Satan. I'll go ahead and just create some bread here and eat. Well, it's a bit deeper than that, isn't it? Jesus is deity. He is God on earth. But he would have been in these physical vessels tempted to that challenge. I mean, the devil chose those specific temptations for a reason. He wasn't just fly by night, happenstance. I'm just going to throw some various temptations at him and no, all of the temptations that are going to be produced towards the Christ are specific to uh, what the flesh desires. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, meaning if you truly are God, well, he knows he is, he is, but yet in the flesh could be very tempted to fall prey to this, this uh, condition the devil sets forth before him. Tell this stone to become bread. Oh, you really believe in God, do you? You think he he loves you? Yeah? You think he's going to save you? He'll take care of you, won't he? I mean, he'll protect you. Jump off a building. 30 stories high. He'll take care of you. He, well, you won't die. I mean... Well, it'd be quite foolish, wouldn't it? Yeah, you're right. God will take care of me. I'm going to jump off a building. <laughs> well, no, and I use an extreme illustration, of course, to the point. God takes care of us, but he is certainly more concerned about our spiritual well-being than physical well-being. Though once we understand that our, phys our spiritual well-being is a priority, our physical well-being will fall suit with that. So Jesus, of course, answers him. It is written. It is written. Jesus is filled with the word of God. He's led by the word of God. He has to fulfill the word of God. The prophets he has to bring to completion in one of these moments in his ministry is to receive these trials, these temptations, these challenges that he knows his followers for all ages to come will have to go through. And how could we associate with a God who would not have been on this earth and been tempted with the same various things that you and I are tempted by? You know what we could do? We could use it as an excuse towards him. Yeah, but you just don't understand. You've not been on this earth and been tempted by the things we have. You're God. You can't understand us. You see, that excuse has vanished because he has walked among us as you and I. And he has something to say. What is that? The word of God. Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil wants him to compromise his faith and obedience to the Father. How so? He's hungry. The devil's very cunning. He's hungry. I'll utilize what his physical body desires the most at this moment to get into 
his spiritual decay. But the son recognizes the deception and quotes scripture. For he is filled with scripture and he is led by scripture for he is scripture on earth. And he says, man shall not live on bread alone. What does that mean? That means what is, what is most important is the nourishment of spiritual, spiritual words. And of course, the devil in verse 5, he keeps going. He leads him. He led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil has power, doesn't he? He has power. He is not as powerful as God, but he has power. And I find it quite interesting how if you once again visit with your eyes verse 1, you will recognize that Jesus is led by the Spirit. He is filled with the Spirit. He is led by the Spirit. He's filled with the Word. He is the Word. He's led by the Word. But yet here in verse 5, the devil led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Was he now in sin to have been led by the devil? Who are we led by? Friends, at times we may be led by the devil and that not inherently sinful. The devil can lead you somewhere and be like, hey, just come here with me. I want to show you something. Yeah, you'll love it. Come see something. Come with me. Come on. That's not a sin if you are found being led by him to a certain location. But what was what's the result of the location he's bringing you to? Or what's the final Conclusion to the thought he wants you to have. Therein is lawlessness. Therein is sin. So the devil can lead, and not only lead, he can show, doesn't he? Of course, look, verse 5, And he led Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Friends, do you seek riches, fame, and fortune? I can lead you to it. I can show it to you. You can have all of it. Power and control. Riches and fame. And the devil says to him in verse 6, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Now we know that the native tongue of the devil is a lie. He lie as he breathes. Yet that does not void the credibility of the claim that he has been given power or permitted power. For he says, I will give you all this domain and its glory for it has been handed over to me. And I give it to whomever I wish. Well, now, wait a minute. He's speaking to a power, the Christ, Jesus, who created all things at the beginning, who, were, who was there at the beginning when the creative process was taking place, when all things were spoken into order. What could the devil offer him that he doesn't already have. Well, you see, it's carnal. It's within the flesh and the desires of men. To have control over the people. To have uh, all these things at his disposal. The devil has them. The devil says, I'll give them to you. You see, you're never going to gain something from the devil without him taking something from you. That's how that works. And you're either going to do that for the devil or you're going to do it for Christ. For it is the same principle we must give in order to receive. But Christ gave himself for the redemption of mankind. The devil 
If you work for him, you will get a paycheck. But it ain't what you think it is. For the wages of sin is death. Well, why call it the wages? Because you're working for him. Who are you being led by? Who are we being led by? The Holy Spirit or the devil? Where is the Holy Spirit leading us? Where is the devil leading us? Who are we working for? What are the wages? You're going to either work for Christ and receive eternal life, or we are going to work for the devil and die. Jesus is seeing this temptation from the perspective of man. He is in flesh. He understands us. So, of course, therefore, he says, the devil, the devil now in verse 7 says, if, well, you see that condition again? He said that in verse 3, didn't he? If you are the Son of God. And then in verse 7, if you worship before me. It shall all be yours. I'll give you wine and women. I'll give you power and kingdoms. I'll give you everything that has been given to me. That's how much it was worth to the devil. Have you thought of that? He was willing to... He, he's at the poker table. Here's the devil. And he's putting all the chips in. All of it. He wants to pull the bluff. He wants the card to be dropped. That's how important it is for the devil at this moment to win over the Son of God. What better bitterness could he have against the Father than to have won over and devoured his Son? How much so was he willing to give of himself? His power. This world. I'll give you this world. I'll give you everything that's at my disposal. All of it. If you just bow down and worship me. That's a small little thing to do, to receive the world. You'll tell your father you were sorry afterwards. Don't worry about it. Come on, bow down and worship me. Well, Jesus answers him in verse 8. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and serve Him only. Thus far, what has been the strength and defense of Jesus towards the very pressing, immediate, heavy-handed temptations of the devil? It is written, it's written here. It's written. When we are tempted through all the vices that the flesh brings forth and its selfish desires and ambitions, where do we go and how do we go about it? No, it is written that I ought not do that. Because those things bring forth chaos. The labor of those things, the wages of that life, is death. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's the right answer, isn't it? Okay, so he doesn't want... He doesn't want to turn stone into uh, bread... He doesn't want everything I have at my disposable, disposal for him, the world, and all its lust, and all its power and pride, and kingdoms and kings and queens. He don't want that. So, the devil led Jesus, in verse 9, to Jerusalem. Let's go closer to the home then. Let's go closer to home with him. And had him stand. So here's the devil leading Jesus to Jerusalem. And the devil takes Jesus to stand on the pinnacle of the temple. Which, uh, friends, would have been 
Uh, I forget the numbers now, but it's very, very, very high. It would have been very high. Could have seen a great many things. He led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to Jesus, if, there's that condition again, right? If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. If you're the son of God, turn stone to bread. If you're the son of God, throw yourself off this pinnacle temple here. And now the devil, he thinks he's going to play the game. So what does he say in verse 10? As the source reason why Jesus should do what he just said. Well, the devil says because the Bible said so. The, the Bible says so, Jesus. That's why you should do it. The Bible says so. Do you know how many individuals sadly are devoured by that cunning deceit? Oceans of individuals, believers, who have been told by the devil, the Bible says so, just do it. And so, of course, the devil knows how to read the Bible and he knows how to quote the Bible, doesn't he? Yeah, look, here it is in verse 10, the devil's going to quote the Bible. It says, he will command his angels, his messengers, concerning you, the Christ, to guard you. And, verse 11, on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Hey, listen. Hey, this is... I got him. I, I, this, I'm going for it, man. He said no to the first one, no to the second one. This one, man, I got him because I'm using the Bible. Throw yourself off this pinnacle. The Bible says that your father will send down messengers and they'll pick you up and you'll be fine. That, of course, <laughs> that is, of course, if you trust the Bible, if you trust God. Well, of course I trust God. <laughs> what are you waiting for? Jump off the bridge. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us the devil knows the Bible and he knows how to manipulate it to his selfish gain. He knows how to quote the scriptures, but he quotes them out of context, doesn't he? How many people today have we sat down with who will pluck out a verse from this book out of its context completely to formulate a, a, a practice or a tradition or a worldview that is foreign to the theme of the scriptures, ultimately in its rightly handled fashion? The devil will quote scripture to try to have us cunningly deceived into believing that there is no uniqueness of the church. Any church will do. You can go to any church you want to. There is no one kind of a church that belongs to Jesus. Jesus, his church is all of us. Everywheres. Any church you want to. Oh, they'll have a, they'll have a verse for that. Oh, yeah. They'll even have a verse that will teach us various different forms of salvation. Oh yeah, if you go out there in all these different churches, all of them have different ways in which we should be saved. And they have Bible verses. The devil, he knows how to lead. And he knows how to show you stuff. And he'll have you stand in locations of temptation. He wants you to fall. So he quotes scripture. Certainly that'll be the, that'll work. Certainly that'll work. Quoting scripture. Well, in verse 12, Jesus, of course, answers the devil. And what does he say to the devil in verse 12? He says, it is said, it is written. The account in Matthew chapter 4 would add. It is said, it is written. Quoting scripture, he says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He tells the devil, You can pluck out Bible verses out of their context and try to deceive me with it all you want. It won't work. Here's what the Bible truly says in its context. 
Here's the true interpretation. Now, of course, the devil in verse 13, when he had finished every temptation he could possibly throw towards the Christ, he left Jesus until an opportune time. What does that mean? Oh, he didn't, say, he didn't give up on Jesus. He just he did his oh fine I guess I can't win you over uh, uh, all right I'll let you I'll leave you be I'll I'll go away now and you'll never hear from me again. No, the devil will never do that while he uh, exists to that opportunity. He'll go away for a little bit, but he's coming back, and he certainly did. He certainly did come back. But I find it interesting, my friends, look at the descriptive ways in which the devil operates. He can lead, he can show, he can have you stand, but guess what? He can also leave. Yeah, see? He left. How did he leave? It is written, Christ utilized the word of God when faced with temptation. Are you faced to be are you faced with the temptation to be idle in your faith, to be apathetic, to be bored with your faith, to put other things of priority in your life? Are you tempted to behave in unchristlike uh, ways? Are you tempted to drift away from the church that belongs to Christ? Are you tempted to entertain more so the world than the words of the Christ? Are we tempted by cowardice at times when we should stand up for Jesus and proclaim His Son? Are we tempted by all the things this world has to throw our way? Sexual deviancies, things that are foul and filthy and perverted, where, our, where are found our thoughts and our words and our eyes? The devil will utilize our thoughts and our flesh, our words, our eyes. He'll lead us around. He'll show us stuff. But will we be led by the Holy Spirit or led by the devil? And friends, in practical application, we must be led by the Holy Spirit. Therein is life. To follow the devil is death. And the devil can be discerned, even though cunning, for he does not have the truth. And his, his promises are vain. You will not be receiving what he says you will be receiving. It's a masquerade. To be led by the Holy Spirit is to be led by the Word of God. And indeed, that is the best way in life, is it not? To understand that our defense against the devil is the Word of God. And so we must know it. We must learn it. We must read it. How do we cling to being led by the words of the Holy Spirit? Friends, we cling together as the faithful. Our true friends are here. Here we are, the church. That doesn't mean we're not friendly with the world out there, with our co-workers and whatnot. But this is our friendship. We cling to the faithful. We fellowship the faithful. That is a practical application and defense. Priority number one. We must know the word and follow the word. The word is our defense when temptation comes our way. The word will lead us if we allow it. Free will. And if we allow it, we will recognize that we must stay together and strong and committed and growing. And therein we will find all the wonderful works to be practiced upright in the church, his church. Benevolence, acts of kindness, Compassion, mercy, forgiveness. It is written, it is written, it is written. 
the devil keeps saying, well, if you do this, well, if you do this, if you believe that, if, I'll give you. No, you won't. No, you won't. You will not give me anything but death, and I don't want to work for you. Don't want to work for you. That sums up the portion here of the scripture we uh, have looked at in this sermon session. Lord willing, we shall move forward next time around. Friends, of course, as always, in invitation and conclusion, please know that if you are struggling with anything in your faith, you don't need to isolate it. You don't need to keep it in you, allowing it to make you unhealthy in your faith. You can confess it. You can approach us either publicly or privately, and we can share with each other. That's what makes us approachable, to be able to share with each other and say, I've been struggling with a sin, or I've been struggling with a, a behavior, or I've been struggling with just discouragement and thoughts. Don't allow yourself to be alone. You are not alone. We have the Christ. I mean, look, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. We have God. We have His Word. You're not alone. You have family. And of course, in all of this, to the obedience of the gospel is available and uh, extended our way. And it came at a great cost. It came at a great cost, and uh, we are thankful to God for that. So if you, if you need to obey the gospel, if you need to confess anything, please know that is always available to you. We are a beautiful and wonderful church. All of us here, I have seen great encouragement in, in all of us. And the love we share for one another, the friendship we share for one another, um, this kind of information is just... Uh, a wonderful guide moving forward uh, in this year as we have been. Okay, that'll do. And uh, we'll move forward with a song.